It says, the king called for Jehoiada, the chief, verse 6, and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? So he's basically taking Jehoiada to task. Right. So Jehoiada has been his mentor. Jehoiada is the one who put him in the position where he is. And he sort of sternly corrects Jehoiada for not going fast enough on the building project. Because remember, he said, hey, make it snappy. Right. You need to hasten this. And they hastened it not. And then he basically calls in Jehoiada, chews him out or whatever. Now, again, if this were a godly king and he's going to finish well and he's going to do well all the way to the end, then you could just say, well, he's just really excited about serving God. And he's tired of the lame old generation being too slow. So he's trying to kind of light a fire under the old timer and get him cranking. But of course, we know that that's not really true, is it? Because we know that Jehoiada is literally the only reason that he's even serving God. And yet he is correcting Jehoiada for not going fast enough. Okay. Now, in light of that, think about the fact that we as Christians, in many ways, we are Joash. All of us in some way, shape or form. What do I mean by that? Is that we've all gotten here because of someone else. Right. Someone either raised us as a Christian or won us to Christ or discipled us and trained us. Right. And so we need to, first of all, understand that we need to be respectful to the people who got us to the point where we are. Okay, we need to respect that. We need to understand that they're maybe at a different stage of life than we are. And, you know, I believe that Joe asked probably a little bit out of line here for correcting Jehoiada so harshly when Jehoiada is a great man of God who's done everything for him just because he's not going fast enough. You know, what's the big deal, man? Relax, chill out. Okay. But you say, well, the Bible doesn't really say one way or the other. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we know the rest of the story. Joash is ultimately going to murder Jehoiada's child. Just let that sink in. Hey, you're not taking the offering fast enough. You're not fixing the building fast enough. You're not doing a good enough job as a high priest. Meanwhile, this guy, as soon as Jehoiada is gone, is going to stop serving God and literally murder Jehoiada's son, showing that he has no respect for Jehoiada. He has no appreciation for what Jehoiada has done for him. Otherwise, he wouldn't be murdering his son later in the chapter. Total disrespect, total disregard. You know, I think about my own life, and there are many people that invested in my life growing up, pastors of churches that I went to, and they fed me the word of God through the preaching. Also, Sunday school teachers that I had that taught me the Bible, Christian school teachers that I had growing up. And here's the thing. At the time, I did not appreciate these people, right? Because children don't necessarily automatically just have gratitude and understand that other people are making sacrifices for them. They sort of just take everything for granted and just expect everything to come to them on a silver platter. But, you know, I was fortunate to grow up in a Christian home where both of my parents are saved. Both of my parents love the Lord and both of my parents were doctrinally sound. So that when I had spiritual conversations growing up, my parents were actually telling me right things. If I think back to conversations that I had with my mom, conversations with my dad, I can think back on those things as a 43-year-old man who has read the Bible a lot as a pastor and being in the ministry. And I can think back and be like, yeah, they were right. Their doctrine was correct. The stuff they taught me was doctrinally sound. I mean, what a blessing to be saved as a six-year-old boy and to have all this good doctrine just handed to me on a silver platter from my parents let alone the churches, the Sunday school classes, the sermons, the Christian school, all those things that were done for me. And I remember there was one guy in particular when I was in elementary school, and he was my uh, elementary school teacher when I was in fourth grade, fifth grade, and part of sixth grade. Then later, when I was in the seventh grade, he was my Bible teacher. And let me tell you something. I thought this guy was a total dork. You know, I didn't like this guy and people didn't, you know, people would make fun of the guy and he was bald and he had the cul-de-sac hairdo. And here's the thing. You remember in the Bible when they're making fun of Elisha and saying, go up thou bald head. And then God sends the bears to eat them. We didn't know that scripture. 
You know, we had, we had never been taught that Bible story. And so, you know, we would make fun of this guy. We would give him a hard time. We would make fun of him for being bald. We'd make fun of him for a lot of reasons and stuff like that. Because we were, you know, we were just being jerks. We're just, that's just how kids are. They don't think about these things. They don't think, hey, this guy is literally dedicating his life. You know, it doesn't mean that he's perfect or anything like that. But this guy is literally in the ministry, dedicating his life, making some tiny salary because he really feels like he's making a difference by teaching us the Bible and actually getting people saved, being in this soul winning church and whatever. And I'm like, you know, but I, that thought never even crossed my mind at the time that this guy is getting paid a really low wage. And look, in, in, in our church and in our movement, we don't believe in paying people slave wages. You know, our employees get paid a livable wage. But what is going on with the sound? Um, I don't know if that's my mic or a different mic. But, but here's the thing. We, you know, we believe in paying people, uh, you know, a good livable wage. We think that's biblical. But let me tell you something. In the old IFB, let me tell you something. There are some low wages being paid. I mean, I mean I'm talking like less than minimum wage kind of stuff. They got them on salary, and I mean, we're talking really low wages for, for some of these guys. And, and these guys, they're doing it because they care, you know, because they believe in it. They're doing it. It's a ministry for them. And so, you know, you look back and, and you start to feel bad. Like, man, I didn't really treat that guy well when I was nine years old, ten years old. I was goofing off and just trying to get away with whatever. But you know what? He was actually teaching right stuff. I mean, the Bible that he was teaching was doctrinally sound and everything. So I thought about this as an adult. I thought back to these people that I had had in my life. And I remember I was in, uh, you know, my mid twenties and I just started faith forward Baptist church not too long ago. And I was thinking back to some of the people that had helped me to get where I was. And so I sat down and wrote this guy a letter. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to write a letter to that guy and just thank him because he was making sacrifices for the kingdom of God. And I just want him to know that, hey, one of his students panned out and is actually pastoring and serving God. And, and I wanted to thank him and say, hey, you're part of the reason why I'm where I am today, because you taught me the Bible. And I, and I thought back to some of my other Bible teachers in different Christian schools I went to that taught me false doctrine. Because there were some that taught false doctrine. But I'm like, well, this guy taught me the truth. So, I, you know, I want to thank this guy. So I wrote him a letter, sent him a letter, di didn't hear anything back. And then uh, I think a few years later, I, I sent another letter because I wasn't really sure that he got the letter. I kind of just heard where I thought he worked at a certain church. So I just kind of sent it to that church and whatever. I don't know if he ever got the letter. But, you know, I finally ended up getting a hold of the guy, you know, like around... 2015 or 2016 or something. I got in touch with the guy and, and basically he told me that he'd seen my documentaries and that he loved it. And he showed the, the one on the King James to his wife. And, 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 you know, now he was married cause he was single back then and everything. And he appreciated it. And we were able to kind of share some fellowship and he was still serving God, still King James, still doing the right things and everything. And you know what? That to me, I felt like I'm thankful to this guy because he's just like another brick in that wall of God building my life and teaching me things and everything. But you know what? To turn around and spit upon the person who won you to Christ or to turn around and spit upon a person who taught you the Bible, baptized you, trained you, did all these things. You know what? It's garbage. It's reprehensible. Those people should be respected in our lives. We should be thankful to the people who've gotten us to the point where we are and not just have this attitude where we did it all ourselves or something. It isn't true. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, as the Apostle Paul said. And you know what? If I would have grown up in a different home with different parents, I would be out there living a worldly, sinful, stupid life because I can totally see myself doing that because in my flesh dwells no good thing. But the spirit, the new man, is what leads me to serve God. And guess what? That's because my parents gave me the gospel. That's because my parents won me to Christ. That's because I grew up in churches that were feeding me sermons from the King James Bible. For the most part, doctrinally sound, good stuff. And turning around, look, my pastor 
who literally sent me here to start this church disowned me and wanted nothing to do with me 18 years ago. Okay, so 18 years ago, it didn't take me six months after starting this church to be disowned by the pastor who sent me here. Okay, to start this church. Why? Because I preached against the preacher of rapture. And guess what? I was right. And I'm still preaching against the preacher of rapture because it's stupid. But anyway, but the point is, you know, he disowned me 18 years ago. But you know what I've never done is I've never attacked him. I've never one time he literally begged me to attack him. He wanted me to attack him. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And the reason he, he said, I'm, I'm sick of people thinking, you know, that I'm associated with you. And so uh, please, please preach against me. Please attack me. And he's like, listening. this is all the stuff I'm wrong about. Preach against me for these things. And I said, I would never do that because I said, I'm super thankful for everything that you've done for me. Okay. And I've brought him up from the pulpit many times in sermon illustrations. And whenever I brought him up by name, it was always positive 100% of the time. I never got up and named him and said anything negative about him for 18 years of preaching. I got up and only praised him from the pulpit. Why? Because he's a great man of God. And you know what? The fact that he has slandered me for the last 18 years does not change the fact that he's a great man of God. And that he invested in my life. He invested in, in Pastor Jimenez's life. And you know what? Nobody's perfect. And I forgive him for doing that because of the fact that he was a great influence in my life. And I would not be where I am today if it were not for him. Amen. And people can... Say that he created a monster or whatever they want to say. But let me tell you something. He did. He did make us. You know, we, Pastor Jimenez and I are both products of his ministry, whether he likes it or not. We're the bastard sons of Pastor Nichols. Okay? Because of the fact that he did teach us, inspire us, motivate us, all those things. You know, I used to, when I was a little kid, I always wanted to be a pastor. I always wanted to be a missionary. I always wanted to preach as a little kid. But when I became a teenager, I totally lost sight of that vision because of the fact that my role models were so lame in that area because we started going to these liberal NIV rock and roll churches and the pastors were so weak and soft and effeminate that I just wasn't motivated anymore. And it didn't make me want to get in the ministry. But then when I turned 17 years old and started going to Regency and getting under Pastor Nichols ministry, I walked up to Pastor Nichols. And I said, you know what? I said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a preacher, but I've completely lost sight of that. I completely lost that vision for the last five years or so or whatever. But I said, you know what? Now I have that vision again, because you know what? You're somebody that I could see myself wanting to be like you. Right. Because you're actually a preacher that I can respect and that I can actually look to as a role model. And he rekindled my desire to be a pastor again. OK. And of course, you know, I learned soul winning at that church. I learned a lot of great doctrine. And so, you know, I'm very thankful for my time there. You know, so being on some crusade to hurt him or to attack him or to criticize him or something, it, it would be ridiculous. It would be wicked, it would be ungodly. But yet we see people throughout scripture, including in this passage, biting the hand that has fed them and turning on an attack. I mean, think about it. if somebody got you out of hell. Think about it. Whatever that person said or did after that, you got a good deal out of that relationship because there's literally nothing worse than going to hell. And so if somebody preached the gospel to you and got you out of hell, you should be thankful to that person for the rest of your life. Yeah. And to sit there and say, oh, well, you got me saved, but now you're such an idiot. No, let me expose you publicly and let me let me just show the world how bad you are. Oh, you got me saved. It's like, you know what? You are a fool and you're just announcing that you're a fool. And by starting out your, your, your statement by you got me saved, you're just telling me you're a double idiot for attacking me like that's supposed to make me take what you're saying more seriously because when somebody comes at me well you got me saved but and then just starts attacking me slandering me rebuking me and all that you know what it just makes me think you know what you're a complete fool to not even have respect 
for the person that you want to cry. So that's not biblical. Actually, it is biblical because the apostle Paul said, you know what? You might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you have not many fathers. And he said, I begot you in the gospel. Now we have these bozos saying, oh, we're, we're putting too much emphasis on who won you to Christ. Well, is that what the apostle Paul said? Apostle Paul is like, hey, Timothy, my son in the faith. Hey, Titus, my own son in the faith. Oh, let me beseech you for Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my bonds. Oh, hey, Galatians, whom I travail in birth for you. Oh, the new IFB is putting too much emphasis on who gets you saved. And you know what? These same bozos are saying that unsaved people can get you saved. That's what they're saying. They're saying an unsaved person can win people to Christ. False prophets can win people to Christ. Wrong. Okay? Because a good tree brings forth good fruit, and it is impossible for a corrupt tree to bring forth good fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That's what the Bible says. And so this attitude that says, oh, unsaved people can win you to Christ. and eh, wrong. That's a whole other sermon of itself. I've already preached that sermon many times. You got to be saved to get somebody saved. Everything brings forth after its own kind, my friend. And let me tell you something, you know, getting someone saved, okay, is you're their spiritual parent in that sense when you win someone to Christ. And the apostle Paul, you know what? He played that card when he literally said, hey, you might have 10,000 instructors, but you don't have many fathers because I've begotten you in the gospel. So why don't you respect that? Oh, no, no, no. But I guess I just made that doctrine up. I guess I didn't get that from the book of 2 Corinthians, right? This is all in the Bible, my friend, okay? And so here's the thing. Joash was handed everything by Jehoiada. Jehoiada puts him on the throne. Jehoiada teaches him who the Lord is, teaches him about the Bible. And then he's turning around and getting upset at Jehoiada just for not moving fast enough or whatever. Now, look, we're always going to have criticisms about our parents, Right. We're always going to have something about our parents that we don't approve of. And we might even be right. And here's the thing. You know what? In this situation, maybe Joash was right in this situation. Maybe Jehoiada should have been moving faster. Maybe he was going too slow. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, does it? Jehoiada is still a great man of God. And Joash is still a poser who's going to be completely out of church and not right with God as soon as Jehoiada is not holding his hand. So here's the thing. Some of the criticisms that we might have of our parents might be legitimate. But it does not mean that we do not owe them respect and appreciation. Some of our criticisms for our pastor or our former pastor or our Sunday school teacher or our Christian school teacher or whoever invested in us in the past. Some of our criticisms of the person who won us to Christ or the person who baptized us or taught us the word of God. Some of those criticisms may or may not be legitimate. And maybe we're even right. Maybe we have gotten right on things that they're wrong about. But at the end of the day, though, we should never stop loving them and respecting them. And we should not turn around and bite that hand that has fed us. It is an uh, and you know, what does the Bible say? People are going to be like in the end times. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. There you go. How's that trifecta? Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. So the Bible says, well, let's move forward.